Cindy.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here in the sanctuary and also out in uh, Zoom land. We are so glad that you are all here by Facebook, internet. Um, whether this is your first time here or you've been part of our faith family for a long time, we are excited that you're here this morning. We are so happy that you're here. Um, if you would, please take a moment to complete a connect card and I can't, I don't have one, maybe Pastor, somebody hold one up. There's a connect card, there you go. Connect card in, in your altar, uh, in your pew. If you'd fill it out and just drop it in the basket in the offering box near the exits, that'd be great. And if you're online, just write a comment and uh, so we know you're here with us this morning. So now, um, if we could, let's, let's worship the Lord together, shall we? Good morning. If you please stand, we're going to start off with your grace is enough. All right. And F, in the key of F. have to give that drummer some overtime pay. Yeah, we'll have to. <laughs> All right, if I could get the kids to come on up. 
Yay! I'm so glad you're here. So where's your brother? He's not feeling good. He's not feeling good? You know what I've got on today? What is this? It's a mask. When I was your age, I didn't know what a mask was. You know why I'm wearing a mask? You know why I'm wearing a mask? Because somebody I know tested positive for COVID. So just in case, I'm going to wear this mask so that I don't give you COVID. What do you think about that? So what can you do with a rope? You can lasso with it like a cowboy? You want to try that? You did it before, but with a different rope. Okay. It's not, it wasn't a rope. It was like this, like this stretchy thing. A stretchy thing? But it was big, bigger than that. Was it really? Yeah. Well, this, this comes and off of my sailboat. You, <laughs> I can't imagine your rope was bigger than this. Whenever you lasso somebody with it, it like sticks onto you. Really? Do you know who Wonder Woman is? Wonder Woman has a lasso, and she puts it on somebody. They have to tell the truth. Aren't you glad your mom doesn't have a lasso of truth? That could be a problem, huh? I did that to my brother. You did that to your brother once? You made him tell the truth? <laughs> did he get in trouble? Yeah, because he was still in trouble. Your new shoes got washed? Well, that's oh, what bubbles do. Well, now they're old. Now they're old. They got Oh, but I, got new I am so glad. I tell you what, have you ever, have you ever heard of the game Tug of War? Yeah. What do you do in Tug of War? You just pull a rope and the other person tries to pull. They do it and you can even see if you're the Really? So you see who's the strongest in Tug of War? Do you want to play Tug of War? Come on! There's your side right there. All right, here's the rules. There's some rules. Rule number one, when I say we're done, we're done, okay? Because if it looks to me like you're going to stretch the rope, no. <laughs> you might break it. You're strong. Really? Okay. Are you ready? So go slowly and go until it gets tight. All right? Now, let's see what you got. Pull. 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 Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Do you need some help? You don't need it. Okay, go ahead. Pull. Pull. I know you are really good at tug of war. Do you really? Aren't you glad he's not here? <laughs> You're just kidding. All right. Does anybody want to help him? Bob says he wants to help. I got slippery shoes on. I suddenly got nervous. All right. Here comes your anchor man. <laughs> Okay, just a little, oh, just a little slack. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, here we go. Pull, pull, pull. Oh, you got this, you got this. Oh, come on, come on. Okay, now he's getting serious. I got a feeling I'm going to get hurt. All right, you guys win. woo -hoo! All right. Wow, Bob, you just about, Yeah. I know you want to launch the pastor after some services, but let's not do it physically, okay? All right. There's a verse that I want to teach you this morning. It's John 15, 31. Can you say that? John 15, 31. And it says, everything I have, everything. say everything I have, everything I have is, yours. is yours. You know who said that? The father in the story of the prodigal son. And he said it to both his sons. They were in a tug of war trying to get what they thought the father had and each tried to get it their own way. But here's the truth. God says to us, everything he has is ours already. So we don't have to try to fight God to get God's blessing. We just need to ask. You see? Right there. There's your sermon. You can all go home. Thank him. Ask nicely. That's true. All right. Let's pray. Are you ready? Put your hands together. Close your eyes. You can't see me do this? No, anyway. All right, dear God, thank you so much for being such a good God, for giving me good things and helping me to be a good person. Amen. I know, but you know what? 
Just because you're the only one in Sunday school, you better have something to, to do. Oh. Try not to eat all those. I and love skin. I know, but don't eat them all. Can you? You're not going to? Are you going to leave one? Are you, yeah, take half those home to your brother. <laughs> I've seen that look. All right, go have fun. <laughs> all right, and now I think we've got a present. Hannah, are you here? Where is she? Well, come on down. Right. Come on up. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we start with Cindy, because you were at the graduation, right? I was. So um, you can use the microphone I'm there. Right. I'll just switch by you here. Yeah, so um, Hannah has been in the United Meth the Roseland United Methodist Church Youth Group since sixth grade, and I've known Hannah since she was like five. And uh, we were, went to her graduation yesterday. It was really wonderful. It was such a blessing to watch this young woman blossom into the young woman she is today. Um, they actually had a plane fly over that said, congratulations, class of 2022. It was very cool. And all the hats went in the air, and it was just wonderful. So I am so blessed to know her. We're going to be sad to see her go off to college, but um, just wish you all the best. Wonderful. And Hannah, why don't you tell them where you, what your plans are? Lisa, there's a cup of coffee down there. Um, I plan to go to the University of North Florida to get a <clears throat> degree in exercise science. And then from there, I hope to get into the phys physical therapy program and get my doctorate in physical therapy. Wonderful. <laughs> Dr. Hannah. All right. And we have something presented from behalf of the scholarship fund of the church. So, and our lay leader is going to tell you all about it. Hannah, we want you to know that Roseland United Methodist Church gives you this, not only just a check, but it is surrounded by prayers and God's grace to guide you along this new journey in your life. It's going to be exciting and many fun times and new times. And we want you to know that your family here supports you in that and you'll be held up by our prayers. Okay. Excellent. Oh. And here's another little gift from us. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for Hannah, for who she is. We ask your blessing upon her and upon her family as she... Uh, steps out of one role and steps into a new role. She's always been a very responsible young lady, but now she's going to be a responsible young lady at UNF. Lord, help Jacksonville. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, Hannah, do you know what that they do up at there at UNF? Study. They swoop. Can you do a swoop? UNF, swoop. Gators do this. <laughs> Swoop. Like an osprey? Like an osprey, yes. My, my daughter Becky graduated uh, from UNF. This song is called Redeemed. You can sit, you can stand, you can kneel, you can lay down in the pew if there's enough room <laughs> in the world. But just worship. Shake 
Take off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. All my life I've been called. Next song is a little song I fell in love with on the radio. Then I looked for months to try to find it. This is back before <laughs> you could just get it off the internet easy. And uh, it's a song by Bebo Norman. And it's called I Know Now. They got a D tune. I 
in the morning. Spirit wash me over. Let me have something and arise. And I never knew I could lay my burden down. And I never knew redemption could be found. I know now. <laughs> no, it's not happening. Start by I never knew. I never knew. <laughs> Ready? I never knew. Yeah. I never knew I could lay my burdens down. Mm. And I never knew redemption could be found. But I know. record something in a different key than you're playing and it, it does that. <laughs> it's all me. That was my bad. Can Summer get, can Summer get extra compensation? <laughs> it's all about the grace, Dan. It's all about the grace. It's all about the grace. Okay. Our grace will be in this. Yeah. <laughs> all right, buddy. <laughs> the Bible tells us that wherever two or more are gathered, Jesus will hear us. So if we can bow our heads. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this body that we can come together and offer our thanks and praises to you, but also put our burdens on your lap. We pray, dear Jesus, for the many conflicts in the world. We pray for the leaders that they have good resolution. We pray for our own nation and our own leadership, ask that they be able to come together and to solve some of the issues that we have through guidance from your touch on their hearts. We pray, dear Jesus, for our own community. We have people here that have needs. Help us to see those needs as a congregation and be able to offer help. We pray for our church leadership, that they help bring families and people to Christ. We thank you now for this time together and ask that you also be with our ones that have medical needs or housing needs, 
our financial needs as well. We thank you now, and we offer this, these words as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, John. Well, it's a good thing grace is enough. It is. So is my uh, microphone on or not? Remember one of those days where you just wanted a mulligan? You know, can we start at uh, hole one again? No, no. Uh, and for those of you who are nervous about this candle, so am I. It's just that kind of day. There. Now that it's not lit, it stands straight. There's a piece of advice in there for those of you who close bars down. If it's not lit, you stand straight. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll start off with a disclaimer. Some of you just got it. Yeah, nice. Nice. I'll send out cliff notes later. All right. Uh, I want to start out with a correction from last week. Somebody mentioned that I said Zelensky was Christian. He's not. What is Zelensky? Jewish. That's why it's so odd that uh, Putin claims that he's denazifying a country that's led by a Jew. Isn't that bizarre? Even more bizarre that a Christian pastor somehow has a blip and calls him a Christian. But you know what? I follow a Jewish carpenter, don't you? Yeah. There you go. All right. And then uh, and it turns out that duet Lisa and I watched online is a hoax. Is a hoax. So maybe they have an endless love, but at least they didn't sing it online. Okay. So that's the kind of world we live in. Isn't it bizarre? You're not sure where true. Didn't we just do a series on fake news? And that's the world we live in. Uh, I want to give an update on the Ukraine, our effort to help the displaced and the hungry, the homeless. Uh, I want to thank you for giving $3,850 uh, that we've sent to the Ukraine. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> All right, so let's continue our series, Who Exactly is Jesus? Uh, in this series, we're looking at just the first 18 verses or so of John's Gospel. Uh, John was one of Jesus' best friends. Uh, he was the last living apostle, and he wrote his gospel so that we, according to John, might come to believe that Jesus is God, the light of man, the hope of the world. So who is Jesus? John is uniquely qualified to tell us who he is. And this week, I want you to take an hour. In my Bible, it's only about 32 pages long, this gospel of John. I want you to take an hour this week and read it from cover to cover. It won't take that long, and it will enrich your life. And any questions or observations you have, feel free to email me or text me and let me know if I can help in your reading of John's Gospel this week. So what's your homework? All right, I hope you, I have a bigger take rate than some high school teachers, okay? Uh, he wrote this Gospel for a reason. And unfortunately, many Christians have never unwrapped this gospel. So here we have this beautiful gift of God that remains unwrapped. Uh, you know, my job is to do what I just asked you to do. Some people think, in a large church, they think the pastor's an administrator, and so that's what they look for, somebody who can manage a staff of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people, make sure all the cogs are oiled and moving in the right direction. They want an administrator. In a small church, uh, they basically want a chaplain. Somebody be there every time uh, somebody goes into the hospital or goes home and is feeling a little blue. Uh, they want a chaplain. But you know, the primary job of every pastor in every church, no matter what its size, no matter what its makeup and its congregation, is actually found by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. Just listen. Christ gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Read the red or the yellow with me, would you? Their responsibility is to equip God's people. Stop right there. So if you took your car to Goodyear to get new tires on it, 
and they put new tires on your car, would you expect them to drive it home for you? No, no. Whose job is it to drive it home? Whose job is it to maintain that vehicle? Yours. But you need some help in maintaining it. Okay, how many of you can manufacture your own tire? Oh, so you count on somebody somewhere, Goodyear, Goodrich, whatever, Uniroyal. Are they still around? Anyway, somebody makes your tire, and then you go to somebody to put it on. And that's really what you need to understand about the role of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Our responsibility is to equip you to do what? To do God's work and build up the church, the body of Christ, in whom we come to such what? Unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. My goal is to build unity, not conformity, but unity, and what kind of unity? In our faith, which means I should be able to pastor Republicans, Independents, and Democrats. It means I should be able to, uh, to pastor with Caucasian and non-Caucasian people. It means I should be able to pastor with all the generations. Because we're after unif- not uniformity, not everybody is the same, but unity in our faith and knowledge of who? God's Son, Jesus. So if you're going to church and teaching you how to be a better KKK member, then you're in the wrong church, okay? Uh, and here's the next part of that, that we may be, read it with me, mature in the Lord. So let me finish that. Because he tells us what immaturity looks like. We act like children, changing our minds about what we believe because someone tells us something new and exciting and different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Not everything you read on the internet is true. Would you agree with that? Not everything you hear coming out of the mouth of a preacher is true. Would you agree with that? I just admitted to you that I made Zelensky a good practicing Jew into a Christian. Okay, So always, with me and with everyone else, every source of truth in your life, vet them. Make sure that what I say or what anybody else says lines up with God's word. That's my job, to make you mature believers that can understand and hear and feel the difference between a, I wish it was true, and what is, in fact, true. So, you know, I was thinking just the other day, I wish the world, what would you wish the world would be like? If you could, if you could light birthday candles on a cake for the world and you blow out the candles and the wish would come true, what is your wish for this world? What would it look like? What do you wish the world would be like? What's that? Peaceful, loving, kind. Okay, kind of a circle of care. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we have this image, most of us carry the same image. There's a couple of wackadoos out there that their ideal world would be one that would bow down and worship them. Uh, those are not healthy people, but they are out there. So what do you think has gone wrong with this ideal world? Because there was a time when God created the, last, the Hebrew word that's used for God's description of every epoch, every stage, every era of creation, and God said it was good. Tov, tov, good. And when he gets done with creation, he looks at it and says, man, I did a pretty good job. It's very good. So no matter how you envision a perfect world, it once was. It was perfect. God don't make no junk. So what's happened to the world? What do you think has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? Sin? Let's get a little more granular than that. What, what has gone wrong with this perfect, this idyllic, this planned utopia that God placed humanity in. What has gone wrong? Greed, free will, selfishness, violence. You know, power imbalances of every description are violence. So people don't always understand that even though you can't see the imbalance of power, the one who feels powerless, the one who feels put upon, the one who feels that they must do because this will... That's violence, and that's not the world that God created. It's the world that we've created and are 
creating. So we have this ideal world. I wish the world was. And we've got a rough idea of what's gone wrong. So the question is, what will fix it? What do you think could fix the world? What do you think? Honest leadership. I love that. How about others? So if we had an honest... uh, Kindness? Yeah, care? Respect? You know, I had a leader in the church, uh, Gene Zimmerman, once told me when I was uh, pastor, the, uh, the leader at First Jacksonville, he said, Jerry, one thing I've learned in my, I think it was 60 years of ministry at that time, is nobody gives up power. I was trying to make some changes that would challenge the status quo. And do you think the people who were benefiting from the status quo were excited about the change? No. You know, not every barbecue has chicken, beef, or pork. Once in a while it has pasture, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> so, so we know. There is an ideal world, and we know that something's gone wrong, and we're not really sure about what will fix it. Well, those three questions actually theologically are called the creation. It was perfect. And the fall, it's no longer perfect, and redemption. You've been singing about it this morning. That's the only thing that will truly fix it. If you have a flat tire and you just decide, I don't want to have a flat, and you continue to drive, what do you still have? And instead of replacing the tire and getting it patched, you'll soon have nothing but scraps of rubber on a rim, and then you'll need a new rim too. So ignoring the brokenness in us and the world is not the answer, and yet we try to do that all the time. Uh, don't, don't raise your hands, but how many of you, if you go to the doctor, it's a last resort? You know, I was raised you know, on baseball teams, football teams. You fall down and you get hurt. What, what does the coach tell you to do? Walk it off, shake it off, rub a little dirt on it, right? That way your mom will think that you didn't, yeah, anyway. Uh, today's verses covers all three of those questions and the reality of the creation, the fall, and redemption. It's found in John 1, 9 through 11. It's the same problem, this need for redemption, this brokenness that was meant to be perfect. It's the same problem, the human condition. We all face it, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. And this problem has two expressions that we're going to address today through the story of the prodigal son. Uh, Just read it with me, would you, John 1, 9 through 11. The true light that gives light to, is there an exception in that? So Jesus came to be the light for who? Everyone. Uh, That true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, we've covered that, the world did not. That's the problem for people who don't know Jesus. First step towards redemption for a non-believer, a non-Christian, is to recognize who Jesus really is. And we've covered that quite a bit so far in this series. But then there's another side to the same coin. There's just one human race, not many races, just one, and we have one basic underlying problem. We need redemption. So the one side, Christians are pretty quick to say, well, you need Jesus. Now let's read the side that is our side of the coin. He came to that which was his own. That's us. But his own did not. Now, everybody who claims to be Christian should have at one point in time professed faith in Christ, received Christ. But the Bible in this place is asking us to look at our reception. Did we really receive Jesus? Or did we just put on a cross? Did we really become a Christ follower, a self-leader and a leader to others in this movement called the way, or are we just going through the motions? Are we just playing church? Have we really received Christ? Or are we just a lowercase c Christian? Now, it's obvious that something's gone wrong with the world, a brutal war in the Ukraine, a firefight in our own country over the right to kill babies and to use assault weapons in a supermarket. If you don't think something's wrong with the world, you just haven't been paying attention to the news. You know, I look in the mirror 
and I see pain, and I see selfishness, I see bias, and I see anger. That's just looking at me. I don't know what you see when you look honestly into your eyes in the mirror in the morning. What John is saying in this verse, these verses, is that what's, what's wrong in the world is that we aren't truly in relation with the one who created the world, the one who gives light to the world, the one who wants to redeem the world. For those people outside of the church, those outside of the faith, we're quick to say, uh, well, that's because you're a sinner. But the Bible assures us we are all what? It also assures us that if we say we have no sin, then we lie, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we're going to push into that, not just the other side, but this side, which applies to most of us here this morning. We think the problem with the world is that people are sinning. But the truth is, the Bible says it's deeper than that. It's deeper than your pet sin. It's deeper than the issue of sexuality. It's deeper than the issue of greed. It's deeper than the issue of the power struggles that we create and benefit and pay the price for. So God made this beautiful planet and said to Adam and Eve, enjoy it. There's just one rule. How would you like to live in a world with one rule? Wouldn't that be amazing? You think you'd remember that one rule? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can remember. I, I got all kinds of rules. I got, I got a rule that says, you know, don't cross me. I've got a rule that says, uh, if I'm behind you and going slower, let me pass you. Right? I've got a rule about, if you don't let me pass you, what happens? Somebody gets angry or somebody gets run off the road. See, there's a response to a rule that we have that other people aren't honoring. God gave this beautiful planet to Adam and Eve and said, there's just one rule. Read it with me, would you? God said to Adam, or gave Adam this warning, you may freely eat of any tree in the garden except, don't you hate exceptions, except fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. To give you a sense, maybe a better or clearer sense of what's happening here, it's as if. I had my granddaughter come to my house and I had this bowl of Skittles there. And I said, honey, you can have all the Skittles you want. Now her mom would have something to say about that, but I'm grandpa, I juice them up, send them home. Anyway, I said, you can have all the Skittles you want except for the green Skittle. This is grandpa's Skittle. And grandpa doesn't want you to have it because if you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay? And my granddaughter, that sweet little thing she is, she's so smart, so loving. She looks at me, she looks over all those, there's yellows and oranges and reds and purples, and she reaches in there and she grabs a green. Now, (sighs) temptation is not sin, did you know that? But then she takes this little green Skittle that she knows she's not supposed to eat because it's Grandpa's Skittle. He puts it in her mouth just like this. What's the problem we have now? (laughs) Yeah, she ate my Skittle, doggone it. (laughs) No... She's not just disobeying. She's sending me a message. What was the message she was sending me? I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do, right? She's not just disobeying. She's telling me that she's the one in charge of our relationship. She's the boss. She doesn't have to pay attention to my rules. And here's where the rubber meets the road for all of us, especially as Christ followers. We do that with God. We know what God says about money. But it's my money and I'll do with what I want. We know what God says about sex. My body, I'll do with it what I want. We know what God says about anger. And we say, but it's my anger and I'll express it in the way I want. We know what God says about forgiveness. We choose when and where and how 
too far. So if you think the problem is just sin, you haven't gone deep enough in this issue of what it means to truly be a human in a world with one God who makes rules. It's deeper than defiance. When we eat that green Skittle, and I'm going to eat another one because I, I brought water up here just in case I choked, but I got away with one. I'm not sure I'll get away with two. Um, but when we eat those Skittles, we look at God and we give God the finger. And it's not the finger of, hey, how you doing, fella? You know, we're saying, God, I am the boss. We've tried to change places with God. God is supposed to be where? Above us. We are supposed to bow down before God. And when we choose to willfully sin, we're saying, I am God of this part of my life. You see, disobedience is a deep-rooted issue for all of us. For the world that does not know God through Jesus Christ, it shows up as defiance. Who are you to tell me what you, you know you Christians can go straight to your own hell. I don't believe in it. Who are you to tell me what morality is? They're defying the one true God. But for those of us who've bowed down to the one true God, who still persist in a pattern of sin, we all sin. St. Augustine said, none of us can keep a bird from flying into our hair. Did you know that? But the truth is, you can keep any bird from building a nest there. Think about it. You can't choose all your thoughts. You can't choose all of your emotions. You can't even choose all of your actions. If, if you go to the doctor and he hits your knee with a hammer, what are you going to do? It's going to kick and then you're going to punch the doctor. What are you doing? Okay, so there's two sides to the same coin. It's called disobedience. Christ came to the world that he made, and the world did not recognize him. Christ came to those who were his own, and his own did not receive him. They wanted to trade places with him. It's a problem of disobedience. Creation is still standing against its God. Defiance and in manipulation. We obey, but we obey with an ulterior motive. And the world defies because it will not accept. We try to use God and the world tries to deny God. Jesus told a story of two sons. Most of you sitting here know the story very well. The first son represents the world. You call him the prodigal son. You got the story now? You dialed in? Okay, and he, this prodigal son wants to live his life on his own terms. So he takes the good gifts of the father and he squanders them on selfish living. Don't throw a rock at that sun without realizing, for most of us in this room, that rock hits our own foot as well. We have been given time and talent and treasures, and we've used them in very selfish ways for me and mine. So we have taken the good gifts of the Father and squandered them on selfish livings. And hard times, as they always do, comes and visited this son, and he comes to his senses, and he returns home. A sideline there. A lot of our Christian ministries, we think we're doing the Father's will, but we're actually allowing people to live less than lives. We're actually allowing them to, I'm not saying we should let anybody go hungry or naked or whatever, but to allow somebody to continue in a pattern of sin and then to fund that pattern of sin is not a Christian response to this issue that we're talking about. They have to be allowed to come to their senses. And if it's your child, is that easy to do? To watch them suffer? To watch them make the wrong decisions? But what happens if you don't? It gets worse. It doesn't just stay the same. Uh, That recalcitrant child becomes a rebellious teen who becomes someone that when the cop pulls over, they say, I'm on a phone call. You just have to wait your turn. Seen those videos? They will not bow down to authority. They are defiant. One of the primary roles of parents is to lovingly teach boundaries and respect and response to legitimate authority. So here's the deal. This first son didn't get it. So he 
takes his inheritance and wanders away and squanders it on riotous, the Bible says, living. But then he is allowed, by the grace of God, to come to his senses. It gets hard enough that he turns around and goes home. And then that's when Luke 15, 32 happens. The father says to the older son, we had to celebrate and be glad. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So if you're part of the naive part of Christendom that thinks that nobody's lost, nobody really needs to be found, uh, nobody's dead in the world and doesn't need to come alive in Christ, then you are preaching an alternate gospel. You are part of that group that Paul spoke out against at the beginning of this message. It may sound like a loving version of God, but it is not the version of God that's revealed in his son, his prophets, or scripture. God wants desperately for none to be lost, but God will allow us to go to the far country and live there in riotous ways as long as we choose to. But when they turn around, we call that what? Repentance. So when they turn around and come home, what do we do? We celebrate. That's the party. Heaven, the Bible says, rejoices and when one sinner comes home. We know that part of the story. We know it so well that we begin to think it's the only part of the story. It's a story about redemption from selfishness. It's about coming back home. But read this with me. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, who is he? Jesus, God. The world did not recognize him. That's that part of the issue. The ones that have not received Christ, the ones who are living in these riotous ways, they have walked away from God. They ignore God. They pretend God doesn't exist. So in our verse today, that's only half of the equation. You know, it it goes on. The the world didn't recognize him, or excuse me, the, the world did not, yeah, recognize him, but we don't receive him. He came to that which was his own. That's who? us, but his own did not receive him, receive him. Uh, If I were to uh, give you a gift and you never unwrapped it, what good was giving the gift? If I I remember a story about uh, a young guy who was in college and he was always asking his parents for money, and so he went to his, his, uh, his, his mom and she says, ask your father, Don't you hate it when they do that? Anyway, uh, so he said, all right, all right, I'll think about it. And so uh, the kid goes back to college. And uh, the wife comes in, so John, did you give him some money? And he said, yeah, I did. I gave him $1,000. She said, $1,000? Are you kidding me? You know, this is back back in the 70s when $1,000 would buy more than a tank of gas. And uh, so (laughs) some of you haven't been to pump lately, okay? All right. So... Anyway, uh, I gave him a $1,000 check, and she said, why would you do that? We can't afford that. I said, don't worry, he'll never cash it. He'll never find it. She says, why not? He says, I taped it a third of the way through his chemistry book. (laughs) (laughs) Many of the gifts of God, the blessings of God, you will never receive because it's a third of the way through the chemistry book. It's a third of the way through your living life God's way. We want the blessing. We don't want to get dressed up to receive the blessing. So what about this second son in this story, the good son, the faithful son, the the, the one who came to church and was a good but angry boy? That's where I want to spend most of my energy in this message. When the father reacted as the father must, uh, the lost was found, the the wayward son came home, came to his senses, woo you know, Was his big brother happy about that? And I want you to see yourself in this. For some of us, we go, yeah, yeah, I guess I see it. For some of us, we go, that's not me at all. And if you're in the that's not me at all crowd, I want you to really think through the rest of this message. So he says to his father, this good boy, this faithful boy, this church boy, he says, all these years I've been what? So what's his image of his father? taskmaster, a slave master. In our anger, often our true motivations, our true understanding, our true feelings are revealed in our anger. Oh, I didn't mean that. 
No, but you said it in an unmasked moment. So he is unmasked in this moment, and he says, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Really? I thought you were doing it because you loved me. I thought you were doing it because you were growing up and maturing. I didn't think you were doing it because I was the chief master sergeant and told you to jump, and on the way up you asked me how I. Yet you never, what? Gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. So what's this young man's true heart? He's jealous. He's jealous of what happened to his brother. And, you know, I've met too many people, including the man in the mirror, which is me, when I've seen other people live in a way I'm thinking, oh, man, I'd love to drive that C8 vet. I'd love to do about 145 down I-95 to keep up with traffic. Okay. <laughs> hey, I, I, you know... Whatever it is for you, whatever ghost you're chasing, that's what is being revealed here. There is a dark side to the Christian faith, to the believer, where we think God is holding us back, that the love of God isn't loving at all. In fact, it's restrictive. And if I just wasn't a believer, if I just hadn't married that person or married into that family or been born into this country, then I could live like a heathen. And so when you are unmasked in these moments and you realize that you really have had this false image of God, that you really haven't been responding out of faithfulness, you've been responding in a way that you thought if you did what God asked you to do in the way God asked you to do it, when he wanted you to do it, then you would earn not just his love, but his blessings. There's a long word for that. What do you suppose it is? starts with M and ends in Sean. Sean? Manipulation. All of us can manipulate. We can manipulate our parents, we can manipulate our spouse, our, our boss, our employees, our neighbors. Uh, we can try to manipulate the country through Facebook or Twitter. Twitter? Twitter? <laughs> a tweeter also has a bass and a mid range on a good speaker set. Uh, but here's what God the Father says to all of us. The ones that are defiant and the ones that are manipulating God, trying to get something out of God that we want by doing it our way. Read it with me, would you? This is so critical. I had um, uh, the kids read it with me or memorize it today. Read it. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. You know, we know the world was made to be perfect, and we wish it was. And, but we know that something has gone terribly wrong, but this is the fix. This is the fix. You are always with me. There's no time in your life, whether you're on the mountain or mountains on top of you, there's no time in your life where you are walking alone. There are times you wish the Holy Spirit wasn't with you, but the Holy Spirit is there trying to encourage you to honor the Father with your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. And it's not just that God is with us. He says what? Read the yellow again. Everything I have is yours. You see, this is said to both the world and to the believer. It's said to all of us. Everything God has is ours. It's called the 100-0 principle. We in the church call it grace. Grace is really this, giving 100% and expecting what? Nothing in return. But but I'm going to give you 50-50. That's a fair deal, right? 50-50 in a marriage, wouldn't that be good? When we went through marriage counseling 100 years ago, they said you got to each give 100%. Anybody else get that advice? How'd that work out for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, But here's how it really works, how grace works, not just... Uh, between you and God, but between you and your spouse, between you and your kids, is you give 100% expecting nothing back. Because as soon as you have an expectation that it's you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, that's manipulation. Well, I gave 99%. I only expected 1% back. I, you know, I, 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 I raised them, I fed them, I clothed them, I sent them off to college, I held their broken heart after their first girlfriend or boyfriend walked away. Uh, you know, they could at least tell me what? Thank you. Well, that's only 1%, right? 
that truly grace? Not really. You say, oh, well, not Jerry. Wait a minute. No, no, I'm serious. This is what we're talking about today. Jesus is true grace. 100% expecting nothing back. If you will begin to live into this 100-0 principle, if you'll begin to truly understand how, how just amazing grace truly is, then the world will be fixed. You know what this would do to Putin? You know what this would do to President Zelensky? You know what this would do in your marriage? your relationship with your kids or your grandkids, if you could begin to live in true grace, to give without expecting anything in return, to get off of that merry-go-round that says, you owe me. At the end of the day, who is Jesus? He's true grace. Does God hope that you'll respond? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did Jesus die on Calvary's cross so that you have the true option to respond? Absolutely. But will God require a response from you? No. So I tell you what, I've got something here that may help solidify this message. Um, Would you come up here a minute? You? Yeah, don't you hate being called to the principal's office? <laughs> I have something for you. Did you open that? No, oh, no. Here's the only here's the only stipulation. Just like God created the world, there was only one rule. There's only one rule for that. No. You have to use it for you. Something that brings you pleasure. Tell them what you just received. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You have to use it on you. All right? Go ahead and have a seat. (laughs) You know, when I do this, I get that reaction a lot. But that's what grace, true grace really is. It's, It's you receive something. You didn't deserve it. You didn't expect it, right? But you need to use it for you. Do. Most of us have that reaction. We think, I don't deserve. I don't need. I don't, whatever the don't doesn't matter. The truth is, that's what grace is. Giving 100%, expecting nothing back. I expect nothing back from you. I don't expect to see that. <laughs> it really is for you. Do something crazy. Do something crazy. Have fun with it. Uh, now, here's one rule for the house don't tell anybody in the second service. <laughs> Everybody will sit up front, okay? (laughs) That is just a drop of grace. You have everything at God's control and God's command at your disposal. And he still just has one rule, that you will receive him, that you will listen to his son and accept true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as the band returns to the stage, we are so grateful for this place where we can discover who Jesus really is. So many of us that have been following Christ for so long, we we really do have unwritten rules. We do really think that there's kind of a balance sheet in heaven where I have to do more good than bad. But the truth is, Father, whether we're the prodigal son or the angry son waiting at home, feeling like you're this taskmaster, you offer the grace that is true to each of us. Help us now to receive that grace in a way where we simply just respond with a thank you, Jesus, and we go forth to live a life that pleases you. And all God's kids said, amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing some song?
from Song Blue. Who is who? Who, who's, who said who said that? Song Song Blue. Neil Diamond. Yeah, Neil Diamond. Yeah. Well, we're not singing that one. <laughs> we could though. We know it. <laughs> yeah, we do. I detuned my guitar. <laughs> I detuned my guitar for the last song, so and I you need a roadie. I need a roadie. <laughs> Somebody get me a roadie. Okay, please stand. Oh, you are. Wow, <laughs> you're way ahead of me, huh? This is Jesus Messiah.
Amen. May you go forth to eat red, yellow, and purple Skittles. But leave the green ones to God, okay? Receive the blessing. God loves you in just an unimaginable way. If there was a refrigerator in heaven, your picture would be on it. Receive the blessing that is yours to claim. Not because you're good enough, not because you're in the right place at the right time, but because God created you. Jesus died to give you that light. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sounded like it was in the wrong key, didn't it? <laughs>